I think we'll get started probably like a minute early, but I'll ask some questions. How many folks here are developers? How many folks here are management? How many are DevOps people? How many are other? All right, okay. So uh, when we get to the presentation today, I'm going to be, I'm going to play all three hats because I have been a DevOps, I've been the network guy, I've been a developer, and now I'm the boss, right? So I'll give you all three views, and uh, some things I'll say will be controversial, but the point here is that whatever I talk about here today, um, when I start, wasn't done in, it wasn't done in a week or a month, it's been a three-year process to get to where we're talking to you, Okay. And so one of the things that we'll discuss is the very first part is a lot of uh, philosophy and culture stuff. And then in the end, I, we'll get into some nitty-gritty technical stuff on some of the things we'll talk about. And I'll talk a little bit about the new Docker plugins from Jenkins today also. I think I guess we can start, right? Can we start? Okay. So I am Mario Cruz. Um, I'm a big Cloud Bees and Jenkins fanboy. Um, the good thing today is I'm not selling anything but how awesome Jenkins is, right? So that's pretty simple, right? And you guys are here for that. Um, I have had a lot of jobs in my career. I've been a network engineer. I've been a developer. I've been in IT ops. I've been a CSO. I have experience with hacking, networking, DevOps. And more importantly, now I'm the pointy hair boss in that cartoon, okay? Um, about five years ago, I built a company called Choose Digital. I was a co-founder. And basically what we built was um, a white label version of iTunes that we ran for um, basically brands. So any, any brand that had points or miles or some sort of currency, you could use those things. To, you know, when you change your oil and you got a free music or download or a free movie rental and you got a pizza, we were the engine behind that, right? And the reason we built this, this sort of platform was to allow the brands to own the users versus iTunes and Amazon, they own the user, right? They want the marketing data about you. They want that, all that stuff. I built a company over five years, and I sold it about a year ago. Uh, we had an exit, so I now work for Viggo. Viggo now owns Choose Digital and owns me. The agenda today is going to be pretty simple. No ops, the snake oil that I'm selling today. Jenkins, the glue that holds all this together. Um, I will talk about Docker a lot. Um, I will talk about Beanstalk on Amazon. I will talk about immutable uh, infrastructure. Uh, how many people know what immutable infrastructure is in this room? Okay, cool. And then I will talk about the most important thing is you have to monitor everything, right? And then some learnings that I've learned just in the last four days here, right? Since last Friday's uh, announcement of the Docker plugins from Jenkins to things that I've learned just on some things that I learned yesterday. I've updated my presentation real time the last three days. Um, some of the things that Mark covered this morning, I actually ripped out of my slides because I'm not going to... Uh, discuss some of the things because it's, he covered it pretty well. But the most important idea for us is to get an idea to code to production, right, in a small time to value ratio. And so what happens in most companies is this starts very, very slow at first, right? Um, if you have monolithic apps, if you're not doing DevOps yet, if you have some sort of mixture of apps where you're doing half enterprise, half green screens like you saw uh, KK talk about those plugins, it doesn't matter what you do, it's how do you start moving that forward. And one of the things that I've learned over the last few days is people have um, not discussed the communication process, right? The communication process is the secret sauce to being successful in any organizations. You saw I discussed this morning uh, about Deming and Bruce Lee, but there was a quote from 1968 from Melvin Conway, which I'm sure some of the guys in this room had probably heard, is your organization's Development process mirrors the organization's communication process, right? If your organization is product heavy, the product team is disjointed, that's how your applications are disjointed, right? You have different apps, you have things that don't talk to each other. So one of the big things that you have to get um, to be successful is break those communication barriers. And we'll, I hear this a lot, right, that you know, I, I hate the silo pictures and break down the silos. You know, I, 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 I think silos are good if the team in that silo is built very well, right? And the common goal of that silo is the common goal for everybody. Um, I'll talk about it later, but Pixar, right? The way Pixar makes movies is they put a team together, and that team makes movies together constantly. That's why they make very successful movies consistently. Where in a movie production, they put people together, they make a movie, by the end of the movie, those 
team is disbanded, right? Most of the team within uh, Pixar stays together through movie through movie. That's why the movies get better, the communication gets better. It's still a team, it's still a silo for that movie, but they know the overarching goal for Pixar and the, they know the overarching goal of the movie. The next thing about no ops, it's, it's not the, the elimination of ops, right? It's the elimination of all the manual handoffs, all the rote work, all the work that's constantly kills you, right? So how many people in this room do the same thing over and over every day, right? So how many people have read the Phoenix Project? So, okay, so there's something called technical debt, right? If I need you to do something for me, but you're constantly doing all this manual, what I'll call bullshit, right? You'll never get to the good stuff because you're always working on the manual bullshit. And the manual bullshit becomes six hours of your day and leaves very little time to do the real work, right? So when people ask me, how do you get DevOps started? Start limiting all that technical debt, right? Start limiting all the things that could be automated. So automation is going to be your savior, right? Because what happens is if you don't automate it, somebody else will, and they'll automate you out of a job. You have two choices, right? And people are scared of automation because they think, I'm going to lose my job to automation. Now if you're the guy that writes the automation. Does that make sense? And then no ops for me is an abstraction, right? So what we've done is we've abstracted this whole part of the ops for the developers. So a developer just pushes code to Git, to GitHub actually, and automatically, I call it automatic, automatically, automatically, that gets pushed wherever it's, it is, right? We have three branches, right? Dev, stage, and prod. If you push to that branch, it gets deployed immediately. So if you push the prod, it's on you, right? That's, it's that simple. So people tell me, this is, a far, this is a Forrester quote from 2011, right? They were pretty forward thinking back then. That it basically involves this automation piece. Now, I always hear, but I don't understand this. So how many people actually go into a bank today? How many people go actually into the bank to a teller? See, this whole, nobody in the room raised their hand for a teller, right? So did we, did we replace a teller's job? No, Bueller. Is the microphone on? So, so what happens is we, we took away that part of the teller that was the rote work, right? You don't walk into the teller and tell her, give me my balance, or what's, how much, you know, or give me a withdrawal, or here's a deposit. Either you're doing it online, or you're doing it at an ATM machine. That's the same way you have to think about this analogy at your office. Whatever can be done that's automated, that somebody has, doesn't have to come to you, right, is how no ops works. It's, it's getting rid of that technical debt where I don't have to come to you to ask you what the balance of the account is. I don't have to ask you, you know, can I change my name on the account? Can, my birthday is incorrect. Those are the things that kill dev and most of the ops guys because that sort of crap bucket comes daily in to the office. The other, thing we, we, the other way you can do this is I think dockers and containers are the best way. I think it's the best thing invented to help DevOps actually leapfrog um, what we've done today. So when I started this project four years ago, when I started uh, Choose Digital, we went through a whole bunch of phases, right? And we ended up going uh, at the end to a pass, and then we actually moved to, to Beanstalk. But we had no container, so we had to build all these things on the fly. We, crypt, we scripted all this code. We scripted all these things. But containers today have the magic that what actually runs on your machine is what runs in production. How many people in this room are using Docker today to develop? Okay. Does anybody know what Docker is? Does, does anybody not know what Docker is? Okay. So by doing the container piece, right, you, you have to get away from these machines and VMs and you're allowed to actually have, we actually can get a developer up and running within this first hour of starting at Choose Digital, right? And that's basically, he gets a brand new machine, he gets a GitHub account, or if he has a GitHub account, we link it to the corporate account. He pulls down the container he wants, now he's up and running, right? All the builds are running there. Now, the way we do that is with, with Jenkins. It's, you know, Jenkins is like cooking with fire. It's one of the most important things that, we, that I want to talk about because one of the things we, that allows you to do is to script everything. Again, when we first started using Jenkins, we, it was just a CI part, right? Then it was a CD part. Now for us, it's the whole enchilada, right? What's happening to, for us is from the piece of the code to the piece of infrastructure is all being handled by Jenkins completely, right? You saw today, well, Mark demoed the live demo, right? We do some of that, and I'm going to show you what we do differently. Where he's actually building the whole data center, we're only building the VPCs that we want. 
or actually the own containers you want, depending on the application, right? So that allows the developer not to worry about security. We don't, it doesn't allow the developer to worry about how it's going to work or what's the capacity. All that's being handled by us at an automated level. All he has to worry about is delivering good code and to deliver the functionality that the product team wants. This is, this is roughly, a, an app, you know, this is roughly our flow. So the most important piece to this flow, right, is everybody understands build, unit test, code analysis, validation test, testing, and package and deploy. The piece we do here that's very important to us is the little arrow going up. Um, back to show of hands. How many of you guys use HipChat or Slack? How many use Jira? How many use think that overlaps? Okay, so when people ask me about how is Jira different from Slack or HipChat, I tell people, Jira is when you tell me about the birth, HipChat is when you tell me about the baby, right? It's five pounds, beautiful boy, that's all I care about, right? If I don't know the details, I'm going to go find it at Jira. And so that's important for us, right? Because I want HipChat to be, hey, the build is happening, the build is ready, the build is live, is the build going live, we had a problem with the build, where's my build, right? I don't want to have a lot of detail in there. The detail should be at the ticket level, so that the guy working on that product understands what the problems are, right? Or what he's doing, or what he's thought about, right? It should be him, the product person, having a discussion. What happens in HipChat is if you add that, then you have development by committee. And how much does that suck, right? It sucks. That's where, that's where HipChat and Slack have this issue now. It's um, you're forced and you're sort of, um, you're bullied into doing things, right? So I keep HipChat about what's important, the gory details are always in Jira. The next piece is we have these little, you see the little check marks are called auto there. Most of our apps are called auto deployed. So if the check mark is set to auto deploy, the app goes into those environments automatically. Where you see a manual piece, right, we're using uh, the, the Jenkins workflow tool to allow the product team to hit the final approval. So they're doing that actual push, right? We put that responsibility on that product person. Are you happy with that site? Are you happy with how it looks on stage? You push the button and it's deployed immediately, right? Our goal is to try to move everything to that, to, back to the product team, right? If you make them part of the process, you make them part of the team, that's why it's important. The other piece here is when we actually build functionality, we, we take what we, you know, this is, this is a, the Amazon uh, sort of uh, way, is the product team writes either a press release or a one-page white paper of what this thing's supposed to do. Not how to do it, not what the business rules are. It's, I want this functionality to do this. Here's the new thing today. Now with our new shop, we, can, we allow you to do a guest checkout without logging in, without registering, and make it very one click. You can't use one click, it's Amazon, but two click checkout, right? So when you do that, that lets a developer have the freedom to build that and how he wants it to build. It allows him to build the rules that he thinks are necessary for that. Because what happens is the, the if product guys are telling you, no, I really want it this way, no, I want it that way, what happens is you've taken the developer's sort of mind out of it, right? We don't hire, I don't hire smart people to not let them think, right? This is another controversial statement that people don't like. But if I'm hiring smart developers, right, I want them to develop. And I will, I will promise you that if I queued everybody in this room right now, you probably know your business rules better than the business people, right? Because you live it, you breathe it, you eat it every day. Right? And that's what people don't understand on the business side. So, right? as, a, as a boss, I understand that. But what happens is most bosses understand that. They think, oh, I know all the rules. I'm the boss. Ha <laughs> ha. Right? But you live and breathe that code every day. You know how the tax works. You know how the checkout works. You know how the PayPal things work. You know how the tender works. You know all this other, what I call, again, the birth part that they don't care about. Right? And so they say, we just want to change that to be in a different part of the flow. But you say... We have tax implications, right? We have all the other implications, you know, in a cart, uh, checkout abandonment. There are things that they don't know about that you know about. So what we've done is say, here's the functionality, you deliver it. But because we're continuous in this flow, they get to see it tomorrow. And they say, well, it kind of sucks. Okay, I'll try it again, right? And like you saw there today, we're about, um, we're about 21%, right? And, uh, and, st and stuff we throw away, right? So we probably push, so in 100 pushes, 21 of them were like, no, oh, that kind of sucked. That's the easiest way to think about it, right? 
And when you see our build logs, which if you want to show you in a little bit, the build logs are important for us because the other thing I hear all the time is, well, you can't do DevOps, you can't do this if you're HIPAA compliant or if you're PCI compliant. Again, I call bullshit on that, right? You have a tool like Jenkins that gives you all the logging capabilities you want. You have a tool like Jenkins that gives you all the build process. You have a, you have a tool like Jenkins that gives you a place to safely store all your credentials to get right, pushed in line at the time of deployment. So in GitHub, right, there is no passwords. In your source code, there is no passwords. right? Outside of the company, there is no passwords. You have all the controls and testing inside the system. So when the auditor comes and say, I want to see this transaction flow, you can say, here's the date, here's the transaction flow, here's the whole process. Then I was going to talk about, about this awesome thing I wrote right, um, about six months ago to actually deploy Docker awesomely to, to ops and to Beanstalk and using ops code. And all that got squashed on Friday. right? So on Friday, I'm, uh, CloudBees announced six new plugins that will actually replace everything I've done. And the reason I'm willing to scrap that is because the other most important piece of this that I want you guys to take away from, if it's not core to your business, you should let somebody else do it, right? That's not core to my business. I'm not going to worry about that plugin anymore. It was core to my business because nobody had that plugin, right? But it's no longer core to my business because KK and Jesse and Mike and all those guys at, at CloudBees and all the guys in the community are going to be uh, are going to build better plugins than me because that is their job for a living. It's not my job for a living. So I'm going to go back to that in a second. So what we do today is in the pipeline. So I'm going to go the old way first. In the pipeline, after the whole build, we actually copied the Docker image onto S3 and then used the Beanstalk deployer from Jenkins to deploy it to Beanstalk. Right. That's going to be a one-click deploy now from Jenkins directly into Beanstalk with traceability of, of the Docker machine and all that things inside Jenkins. So I don't longer have this other logging system. Does that make sense, everybody? OK. And so basically, that's the job up there. That's the Jenkins CI. And here's the Beanstalk app. And why that's important right, is what you saw this morning. I'm going to give you a representation here. So I'm going to spend probably a couple of minutes on this slide. So one of the most important things that, we, that I want you to, to, dis, to sort of discuss is this is basically what we call our one environment. So this is the same thing for prod, for stage, and for dev. So we have one environment. And actually, it's duplicated because it runs east and west. But let's say it's only east for now, OK, to make it simple. So we have one, we have one basically, VPC inside the east, right, that's running in multi-availability zones, right? It has SNS, it has search, it has DynamoDB, RDS, has all the stuff you need right, to package. That stays core to Amazon, so we don't touch, touch any of that in our build unless we're actually making a change. But what, what gets replaced in every build is this piece here that you saw on the slide before. right? It's only that part of the VPC of the Beanstalk part. So instead of what you saw today, Mark II, he replaced the whole technically virtual data center. I'm only re replacing racks of the data center. So what that lets me do is actually deploy fairly quickly, right? So if you're doing a full, if you're doing a full like destroy, it can, uh, so if you do a full destroy at 8 p.m. on the East Coast or 8 p.m. on the West Coast, it's about 34 minutes to get a stack up and running at peak time, right? I don't know how many people you know that, but it's about 34 minutes. If you're only doing the part of the of the, uh, be of the Beanstalk stack, it's about 12 minutes, right? So you think, well, that's not a big savings, but it is if I want to watch the football game or I want something else, right? Um, and so those are the things that are quicker, faster, and have visibility. So everybody's heard today about immutable infrastructure. What that means is you never destroy what was there before. Never, ever, 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 right? So this is the best picture. Here's the old stadium, there's the new stadium, right? When it's ready, people just switch stadiums and that won't be torn down if everybody's happy. That's the best way to think about this. Does that make sense, everybody? So every stack is a new stack. Every stack stands on its own, right? The old stack stays there. So when you do a deploy to those that little circuit you have, this is now in Beanstalk, you see basically my environment was finally created you know, very happily. There's you know, a whole bunch of other stuff that goes down there. It's green, right? I'm happy. 
in my running versions, I push the build number. I push what uh, environment it's in. So it's basically from right from here, I can tell you this is uh, stage, front end Viggle, and it's a 628th push of this quarter. Okay? Now, how many people here have the same problem with Amazon where you see all these numbers that don't make sense to you? So one of the cool things that I've started doing is in the tags, you can push this. So then in the logs, you can actually grab that tag and now put it in the search. There's a new feature that Amazon hasn't sort of released yet, but any tag you push, and you can put it in the search of your EC2 content, and it shows you those things. That's important when you have a misbehaving container and you're trying to find it before it dies, which is a problem I have today, but once I go to the new Docker thing, I won't have that because I have traceability on, on, on the Jenkins side. Today, I don't. So that, if that machine dies, the logs die within... Um, being stuck. And then today you've heard a lot about this blue green deploy, right? So back to the, this immutable infrastructure. The most important piece is the blue deployment is what's currently running today, right? And I'm going to talk about two different deployments. One is called blue green and one's called canary. They both do the same thing. The difference is one is what you saw Mark do today, right? So a canary is basically where you're doing A, B where the C name is being weighted, so it's on the blue side is weighted 90%, and the green side is weighted 10%. So 10% of the traffic is going there first, right? I don't do any of that, right? I don't really care, because I'll show you why. Basically, when it's up and running, when Jenkins tells me the stack is perfect, when all my smoke tests pass, when I get back all the things with, back from Jenkins that I'm happy with, the next thing I do is start another Jenkins script that does the Route 53 C name change. So it goes from that C name to this C name. But most importantly, in case of emergency, I can break the glass, right? So I just told you, if you're doing a, a full deploy today, um, it takes about, again, like 23 to 43 minutes at, at peak times. This takes as fast as your TTL for DNS. So I messed up. This is my new, this is my new URL at the bottom there that's mapped to the C name. That's the name that automatically Amazon gives you. They have a button that says swap URL. So when I hit swap URL, I go back to the 125 build, right? I get rid of the 127 build. In about five to six minutes, as, as all TTLs get updated, I'm back to the old code. I didn't have to push anything. I didn't have to run Jenkins. I didn't have to go do anything. Now, the cool thing about this is this can be done on the Amazon app on your phone, right? This is, so if you're at dinner, let's say, right, and a build went wrong, and you know, you're the boss, I could go in there and swap it back, right? This is pretty cool, right? This is built into Amazon. I didn't, I didn't write any of this. I didn't do any of this. I just took what's there, and I'm leveraging that, right? That allows us to say, hey, you know what? The 15th screen of some search is broken, right? And it's important because maybe it's a, it's a screen where we're doing a promotion or something like that for somebody that's paid us for that promotion. We can swap the URL, go fix it, and deploy again. Right? And in about 25 minutes, I will have the new stack up and running again, and now we swap the URLs again. Does this make sense to everybody? Yeah. Now, the way you keep your job, and the way you are successful at your job, if you're an ops, DevOps, no ops, or developer, is basically to monitor everything and, and do metrics, right? Um, I, will, I will tell you that I am the hugest fan of New Relic. I don't know if anybody here uses New Relic, but New Relic is a tool that has saved me many, many times. Um, it's worth all the money I pay for New Relic, even though it's very expensive, right? Because it lets me drill down on transactions, it lets me drill down where are my problems, it lets me drill down on what's taking too much time, it lets you drill down on bots. It's one of those things that's very important. The second most important thing is your Amazon metrics, right? Um, a lot of people want to go thin and wide, and we go very thin and wide. If you're running on a VPC, you can run a T2 micro as your minimum instance. And we basically run everything on T2 micros and go from about 15 T2 micros to about 200. On, uh, so our, our biggest traffic is always, we have two big applications. So we have an application that's like a gossip site. So noon Eastern, all the girls go to that site and crush us. And then noon West Coast, they crush us. And then if Bruce Jenner is changing sex, or if one of the Kardashians did something stupid, we get crushed also, right? But on those crush times, we go anywhere from 25 servers to about, about 250 servers, 
Okay. The next thing is to log everything. So uh, there's Logly, there's paper trails. I don't care what you use, but you have to log everything. And the, the, the good thing about using a log server that's basically gets a model and puts them in timestamp order is you don't have to worry about which server it came from. It's in timestamp order. So when things go badly, you'll see when they go badly. Um, one of the things that I, I, I like to do on this piece is we tie, this is basically, um, it's, it's a new tool that I started using. Uh, it's pretty cool. They actually give you real-time statistics of your site, right? And one of the things we do is we correlate that with the performance of the machines and the performance of availability they're having. So if you, I, you saw me turn off my email, my, my Wi-Fi, but if I have my Wi-Fi on, when we get crushed, you, see, you get all those AWS stack emails you know, that come up and you see the stack grow, and then you see the stack come back. That piece of code is also built in our Jenkins piece. So you, we tell it what's the max What's the load time, and what's you know how long to have the cooldown period? Those things will always save your butt. Now, if it's the first time you do an app that does this, you run into trouble because by default, Amazon unless you do like 90 or 85 in an account. So to go over 85, you actually have to email your Amazon rep or open a ticket, and they'll just give it to you. They do that so that um, hackers don't use that to spam or do bots or do DNS or do DNS on sites, excuse me. The other thing we actually do here is, too, is on the logging, is we have feature sets. So we push, sometime, we push a lot of stuff sometimes that we have to wait for a third party, right? We're waiting for a third party API to be pushed to production or waiting for a third party partner. The feature flag in your apps are very important. And something I, I, didn't, I didn't discuss here is one of the biggest things we use is uh, how many people use the Netflix OSS? Anybody using Netflix OSS? So Netflix has an open source system that has like Hystrix, uh, Arcus. We use Hystrix and Arcus pretty heavily. And Arcus is basically has a feature flag system built into it, right? That so actually has it in code or actually has it pretty front end now so your, your ops team can actually turn things on and off. We do this to turn on features like let's say we have, um, I want to turn off the guest check-in like we just talked about. I added it, but it's a big weekend and I want to have more users to the site because I need to the business wants more users, more new logins, new registration. So I turn off the guest feature for that weekend to see if it, if it actually got me new logins or got me more cart abandonments, right? That's always a fight on any retail site is, you know, how much do you want to know about the user? How much do we let them do? Something very simple. So I would tell you that um, Netflix OSS is, is a very, very um, powerful tool. And if you use Chaos Monkey, we'll you know, I didn't talk about Chaos Monkey, but Chaos Monkey is another tool we use that basically you add these two things to your site and it actually break your site on purpose. They do things randomly so you can see if you can actually survive. Okay? It's open source. Anybody can use it. You don't have to attribute anybody. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. Now, I, was, I did about three, two slides, actually three slides, of how we do this process. One of the, one of the cool things that we saw uh, on Friday um, is that CloudBees, right, came up with these six um, new Docker plugins. And I, did anybody go to KK's talk yesterday about the plugins? So these plugins have the, the two plugins that I'm most interested in, right, is basically there's one that does the traceability and one that does it by deploy immediately, right? Those two things will save you lots of time. And all those logs now are in Jenkins. All that data is in Jenkins, which is important. If you, if you get audited or you in, have... Uh, basically compliance issues, that's what you want to have all your build stuff and all your programming and all your security stuff in one place, one repo for the auditor to come back and look at. But basically, what they've done is they let you now grab any image directly in the pipeline, push it to Docker, to Docker registry, right? Automatically now push my code into to Beanstalk, pull that from the Docker registry, and it saves me all this sending stuff to S3, waiting for S3 to finish, doing the callback to S3, having these images on S3, even though it's secure. I don't know if I want that stuff out there. That's, that stuff is pretty cool, right? And so within six weeks, I will move everything, all my plugins to be the new uh, enterprise plugins by CloudBees. So this is my CloudBees plug. Again, I don't work for CloudBees, but I'll tell you, one of the things we do with CloudBees is they, they run our Jenkins systems, right? I use their SaaS model 
for Jenkins Enterprise, I use their dev cloud. And one of the things we use them for is because that's their business, right? We, I, I think there's a lot of people that asked for those Docker plugins like six months ago um, when, when Docker started becoming a, a thing for us. Uh, I wasn't, you know, we were probably ahead of the curve by a month, but two months later, everybody's using Docker. The community asked for that, right? Open source started working on it, and they delivered within six months, they delivered not one, but six plugins to help you do this, right? That's, that's what CloudBees does for me, right? I, I, I don't mind giving my money because I don't have to worry about how many slaves I have, how many masters, what's my space, right? What's the runtime? If I have a month where I, my runtime is out of control, I just pay more, right? It's, it's still different from Amazon. If you're successful and you're getting crushed, nobody's going to blame you if you're paying more. It's when you pay more and you have no, no dollars that people sort of kick your ass about it. Again, the other big piece here is the professional support. And the high, you know, high availability is the other piece. If you lose a master, right, I don't care. It's their problem. When, when upgrade time comes, I don't care. It's their problem. When new plugins come in, I don't care. It's their problem. See, that's, you know, that's not my core business, right? I only do things when I have to do them, but as soon as somebody else does it better than me, I'm going to pay you to do it because I will never be able to do it as good as you, if that's your core business, than, than, than me. My core business is, is to analyze the, the metrics, the data, and the information to sell more albums, more music, more movies, more TV, right? That's our goal, right? I don't make money by Jenkins. I don't make money on Amazon. I make money by selling people products, right? So my goal is to know as much as I can about you to sell you the right product at the right time, right? Not how many slaves do I need or how many masters do I need or do I have to upgrade to a new version of Jenkins or a new workflow? I don't care. I open a ticket, I, I forget about it, right? My ticket's closed, it's there. Cool, I have time. And then the last most important piece is, I want to go over this quote, is what happens in this, the, the DevOps and NoOps world is people think about, you know, I, we don't like people, like uh, an apple orchard, right? The apple farm doesn't care about the apple, he cares about the apple tree. When you start caring about the apple, the tree dies, right? This is a part of the team. One of the things that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close on how the DevOps, new ops work is how many people here are running microservices? Show of hands, running microservices. Okay. I think in the next two to three years, right, microservices is going to continue to sort of blow up. And what's going to happen is when you have 1,000 microservices, right, uh, one Dev, two or three DevOps guys can handle 1,000 microservices. They're not going to show how they work, how they talk to each other, how they communicate. So one of the things that... I'm a big proponent of right now is the software architect of the past is coming back. But this time he's not some guy in the ivory tower writing use cases or, or case tools, right? He's a guy in the team that understands all the important stuff on the infrastructure, right? How the, these microservices talk to each other, how third party APIs work, right? So what we're doing is we're taking this DevOps person and we're putting him as part of the team, right? We're doing the Pixar approach. Put a team together so that understands all the microservices they're working on all the functionality they're working on, all the third party guys they have to sort of interface with, all the infrastructure piece they have to understand, right? And if you do that, that team can deliver consistently because they all talk to each other, they all know what's out there, right? If a change comes from one of the other teams or there's a best practice, those things are what gets shared, right? And so those, the new architect is really just an awesome DevOps guy that now can code, can build infrastructure, knows networking, right? Um, on a panel on Monday, somebody asked me, but what happens to the guys at Rack and Stack? The guys at Rack and Stack will always be the guys at Rack and Stack, right? The guys at Rack and Stack servers at your data center or at your own office are not really DevOps guys, right? They're just network ops guys, right? This is where people get confused with that role. And those guys aren't being replaced. If you're running Iron at your place or Iron at your data center, somebody's got to Rack and Stack them. Somebody's got to build networking gear, right? Somebody's got to understand how to patch that stuff. Somebody has to understand all the compliance that goes with that. That's real work, right? And half of that can be automated, unfortunately, right? It can if you go Docker, but not when you have real iron, okay? Um, so I think I'm, that's my last slide. I wanted to leave time for some questions, so you can ask me questions or you can uh, have an early break, but I'm, I'm open for any questions. I have some free, if you come see me, I have free music cards and free uh, book cards, if I got I'll give you guys out. Uh, if, you're, if you're a European, just enter the White House address and you can get everything but a movie, okay? You can get music, you can get books, just enter the White House address. Because we only do IP checking when you're streaming a movie. Any questions? 
have a question. Uh, you use um, Amazon Install uh, to, to run Docker containers. What, what are your thoughts on that? So we're running, so right now um, in actually Beanstalk, you can actually run a container service in Beanstalk. Now, Amazon has announced this new container service. So everybody's heard of IIS and PaaS. The future is going to be CAS. Even though somebody already owns CAS as a, as a name, container as a service will be the new, but you heard it here first, right? And the next six months, container as a service will be the next big thing, right? That's the new bingo buzzword. Uh, we're just using Beanstalk plain out of the box. So Beanstalk added support for Docker about nine months ago. And uh, one of the cool features that, Bean, that they did currently is I can, up, I can actually upgrade Docker inside Beanstalk without having to go back for the image, right? So let's say there's some sort of security patch. I can actually patch it within Beanstalk and patch it at the repo, and the next build will have both, right? So I don't have to do a build if I don't want to. I still do it because the next guy that's coming along doesn't know that it didn't get patched, but you can. So Beanstalk out of the, uh, Beanstalk out of the box does Docker, PHP, Java, I think WordPress, so those are things. So you, you actually can build a sample app, get it running, and then deploy right to that sample app. So I would tell you guys, Beanstalk is a pretty cool tool. It's a semi-pass. You have to worry about all the other stuff yourself. It's a pass in the sense that it runs whatever you push there, right? But you still have to build the infrastructure. You still have to build the security. That's on you, right? They're just building the blob. They're running the blob you put. Does that answer your question? Oh, I was just wondering if you have taken a look at ECS yet. Yeah, no, I, we're, we're looking at container services. Uh, that's, we're looking at that a little bit, but only if we're looking at doing some clustering stuff. So I might build a cluster there, right? Where I'm not running an Amazon app. Right now we do everything with Amazon inside the uh, RDS and Dynamo, but I'm looking at running like a Hadoop cluster. I might build that there because I'm going to build that using Docker's cluster on EC2 container service. So that's something I'm looking into doing right now. No other questions? Yes. Yeah, and this is regarding one of the slides we just talked about switching the URLs uh, when you deploy a new build. Uh, who is responsible for maintaining the slash position? So this is all automated, right? The only thing that's not automated is the break glass feature, right? So when you push, right, Jenkins actually, this actually has a build number to it. You see the build number? So that we, we query the using the CI, we query the build number and it tells me the URL. So that URL down there is automatically given to you by Amazon. That URL has a similar URL on this side. But the moment you apply a C name to it, it shows you the C name name, right? So my C name is, so by default, everything on, on, on Beanstalk says dot Beanstalk. So I have a C name that says webpaint.com equals webpaint.prod. Right? So basically, in my CI script, you can tell me, hey, what build, what's the name, what's the URL of this build? It gets back to me, and that's what I pushed the route 53 to do the, the swap here. Okay, so all that is scripted. I don't touch any of that. And it, that only happens if three things actually happen. After the whole thing happens, after all the smoke tests, I give it about a, a two-minute wait window. I pull back two URLs. So I have a hidden URL on our site that actually gives me the build number. If the build number matches the Jenkins build number, that's the first pass. The second pass is I have a hidden image on one of the pages. I do a URL type page and make sure it comes back within three seconds. Right? And the third one is just basically do a, actually do a search. Uh, I'll show you our app if you want. Do a search on an artist to see if I'm getting back search results. Those three things happen, the swap happens. Right? And then the only thing that's not automated in this whole script is the uh-oh button. Right? Does that make sense? No. <laughs> um, I will put this up on SlideShare tomorrow. Uh, my SlideShare is Mario Cruz. My Twitter is at Mario Cruz. I will also put it on my Twitter. Um, again, thank you for coming to the conference. I think, you know, this is my third year coming to the Jenkins conference, and it's grown every year. It's doubled, right? Um, the cool thing about this is that you guys, you know, you guys hope things happen, right? Um, none of these ideas are exclusively mine, right? I have learned stuff at these conferences at the Jenkins conference. I've learned stuff on some of the webinars. I learned a lot of stuff inside. Uh, so the Jenkins has like a new um, newsletter you can actually join. It comes out monthly, it has some pretty good ideas on it, right? And so I tell people, steal, remix, redo, right? Um, nobody cares. The only thing that happens is get the server running, get the product running, make money, right? If you make money, nobody's ever gonna fire you for making money. That's what I tell every developer. If you're making money, you'll always have a job. Thank you very much. <laughs>